Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the Laura Mayfield Township Disability Advisory Board meeting. So we have a, an eventful uh, agenda today. Um, we have with us, um, well, I'll, actually, I'll let the three individuals on in the group uh, introduce themselves. Uh, my name is David Mann. I'm chairperson of the Disability Advisory Board. Trisha O'Donnell, vice chair. And Lisa Huckler, secretary. And I'm John Lewis, the supervisor liaison. Okay, great. Glad to have you all here tonight. So before we jump into our agenda, uh, Lisa had a brief comment that she wanted to make. I just wanted to express our sincere, our sincere condolences to Brian Derby's family. He worked for the Parks and Rec Department and he often assisted us in our community events that we attended. Our hearts go out to all of his fellow coworkers at Lower Mayfield Township, his friends and family. Rest in peace, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for that, um, rem remembering Brian. So the first uh, item we have on our agenda is approval of last meeting's minutes. Is there a motion to do that? So moved. Is there a second? I second the motion. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, all opposed say nay. Okay, the ayes have it. Okay, our next, our next uh, agenda item is community reminders. These are things that I think are important to mention. We've mentioned them in some of our past meetings, but since we are broadcasting our meetings on Facebook, I think it's, um, I think it's good to remind people of, um, we wanna remind people, uh, I think of three things, SMART 911, that Laura Makefield Township also police uh, list. And the third thing is uh, resources for people who are uh, voters with disabilities. So Lisa and Trish I'll, and John, if you can help me with some of these items, SMART 911 is a count, um, uh, it's an application that you can put, or you can go online on the, uh, your regular computer and register, but uh, I think it's most valuable when it's on your phone. It provides, uh, it, it allows you to record an, a bunch of health, medical information, contact information, things that first responders would want to know about you in case there was an emergency. And so uh, the, the app also has the ability to track where you are if you allow it to. Um, or, and that could be all the time, that could be just when the app is open. Um, and so what it allows is basically first responders to have what they need to help you quickly. And so if, I think it's a good option for every, anyone, but especially if you're a person who has complex medical conditions or things that you would want a first responder to know immediately, Smart 911 is a good option for you. So you, you do wanna look into it. Lisa or Trish or John, do you have any other comments about that? Smart 911, you can get it at smart911.com and then I'll let you download either the iOS or the Android app. Um, just going right there and you can get it from there. Okay. Great. So Lisa, could you spend just a couple of minutes telling uh, people about the, the Lower Meekfield Township police list? I know that uh, we call it the police list, but it's essentially a list of people with um, medical needs or disabilities in the township that may need extra assistance from township police in emergency situations like snowstorms or power outages or things like that. Can you provide a little bit more detail? Yeah, what, we used to help them keep up a list, but I think pretty much now they, uh, people themselves can call in and just alert our police department that they have someone in the home. There is a form if you go on to lmt.org and it's under, you can even just uh, click on forms and it's called premise um, emergency form. And like you said, it would just kind of list out your name and phone number and any identifying disability you may have or a child in the house, uh, maybe you know where their bedroom is. So if there is a first responder, um, they might know that a child could be upstairs in a certain in a certain room. They use these lists more for 
just like we have with the COVID situation where people were calling and they were doing checks on, on people during uh, the time that we were in quarantine. Uh, they will reach out, like when there was flooding going on, they would make sure, send a police officer over there and see if they needed any assistance if they had to evacuate. So those are very specific, um, not only if you're calling 911, but it, it kind of alerts them if there is an upcoming emergency situation that they can do a house check. So if anybody, like I said, you can fill out the form online, you can just call the non-emergency police uh, phone number and see if you can kind of get on a, a, a list that the police do have and can provide extra assistance. Okay, thank you. And then the third thing that I want to talk about for a few minutes is, is options for people with disabilities regarding voting. Um, I believe that all the townships voting sites are accessible, so that's required by law. Also remember that the voting booths themselves can be lowered. So if you're a person with a disability and you cannot reach one that's higher, it can be moved down for you. I found that the, the poll workers in the township are usually very accommodating for people with, uh, people with disabilities. But uh, one thing that I think is important to note is that for whatever reason, um, and there's a big reason right now, the, the coronavirus, uh, if you're unable to go to an individual polling site, you can request a mail-in ballot. In this Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you can request a mail-in ballot um, for any reason. Uh, including a health reason or, uh, or well, any reason, so health reason or no health reason, you can, you can request a, uh, a ballot and they can be um, mailed in and they can also be deposited at certain locations within the, uh, within the, the county, okay? So is there anything that some of the people would like to add to that? I think you can also, you can just call the County Board of Elections in Doylestown, they'll mail a ballot out to you right away. There's still plenty of time for that. Right. And you can do that online at votespa.com. Thank you, John, for the link. I appreciate it. Okay. Just make sure that um, voting is a very important thing. Um, don't let your, your disability be an obstacle to it. Um, if you want your voice to be heard through voting, you know, please pursue one of those avenues to, to, uh, to vote. Okay. So the next thing we want to move to in the agenda are new developments on the pandemic's effects on people with disabilities. And this is kind of an ongoing series that we've had. This is kind of an opportunity for members to share anything that they've come across regarding ways that the pandemic is affecting people with disabilities. Something to share, a news article, um, observations that you've seen uh, within the, the township community. I mean, nothing, I don't have anything new other than what we've already discussed, you know, with it's just more difficult for people with disabilities to kind of get out, uh, still fearing for, you know, they might be more uh, susceptible to, you know, catching the coronavirus, uh, but also that we talked about getting help in. So it's still, it's still impacting people with disabilities and being home and home care. Um, so I know that uh, having a hard time just with nursing staff and all. Uh, getting someone to come in home uh, because maybe they work in a facility and they wouldn't might be bringing back, uh, you know, the coronavirus into somebody's home. So I know that that is impacting many still, and I think it will impact ongoing for a long time until a vaccine for healthcare workers might be, you know, provided first. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's, uh, I think some, some people are, are a little bit more willing to go out given the prevalence rates of the virus in our area. Um, but I know a lot of people with disabilities that are still greatly concerned and, and um, about what would happen to them if they caught it. And I think that there's a lot of people with disabilities that I know and, and even actually myself that 
I'm being more cautious relative to some other people that I know because I understand that if I'm exposed to the virus, my, my risk of getting very sick is, is relatively high compared to, to other individuals. I think that a lot of, at least as you said, I think a lot of the, the, the effects of uh, the disruptions that um, have been caused by the pandemic, like for healthcare workers and other industries, I, I study um, issues like employment, people who provide employment supports to people with disabilities. There's been great disruptions in those types of industries. So if you've got people providing services to people with disabilities, whether they be healthcare services or employment services or other services, and those services are disrupted or are only provided at 50% or, or some kind of reduced capacity, that's gonna create delays, that's gonna create um, issues relative to what what was occurring before the pandemic um, started in our country. So um, for me, the takeaway is that the, the effects of the pandemic are still very much with the community, uh, the disability community. So, um, and I think, well, we should be vigilant um, as, as we go into the fall, into the winter. And, um, and I feel that we're going to be talking about the pandemic effects at, at our next meeting as well um, as we continue to, to go through this crisis together. Is there anything that you want to add, Trish or Lisa or John? No, I don't have anything new. Okay. The one thing that I'm concerned about is transportation services. Um, that's an issue for those who do need to get out. Uh, it is harder to get access to accessible transportation than it once was. Um, I also think in general, the pandemics really forced us to think a lot about how uh, our bike paths and our sidewalk structure uh, is available for everyone. And that's some of them we were working on at the township level in terms of, um, you know, uh, applying for grants for ADA ramps, but also fixing bike paths. Because we know people need to get out and get air and you can't stay in the house all the time. Yeah. No, I very much, very much agree with you. And, uh, you know, I know that the bike paths have been, have been, I think, an asset during the pandemic. I think sometimes I've been cautious to go on them because if someone is going to come in the other way and they're not social distancing, I can't just go over the curb um, to get away from them. Um, if, uh, for residents who live in, especially Yardley Hunt, if you see, uh, someone going around the neighborhood in a motorized wheelchair, that's probably been me trying to, to get out and get some air. Um, not just stay inside all day, even though my family and I are pretty so uh, isolated to, to make sure that uh, none of us get sick. So, okay, on to the next, to the next uh, set category of our agenda, it's updates. So we have, three updates. One is building plans and our, our uh, member, Dave, who usually focuses on business plans uh, or building plans, excuse me, is not here today. So I think we can skip that part. I think things I would like to talk about though is the, the Pricket track. It sounds like uh, it was approved to go forward and I'd like to just uh, mostly put it on John's radar about what our goals are for trying to provide input into that development. Um, and then I also want to talk about the site reviews. Our, the members of the board have been going to certain recreational sites within the township and reviewing them for accessibility. And I'd like to spend, I don't want to spend time giving all of our findings, but I'd like, like each person to provide a few highlights of what they saw. So first the cricket, Tracked. So, John, it's my understanding that the that the uh, the, town, the board of supervisors voted um, to move forward with the development of that into a, a multi-use site with a Wegmans and other commercial retailer. Yep. And then, um, as well as an, uh, apartments. Yeah. So um, the board of supervisors passed what's called a, a zoning overlay. And what that allows the developer to do is for the two parcels that were joined 
um, that are within the historic district uh, or Edgewood Village, they are able to get a whole new list of things that they can develop on the site. And it's predominant, it's designed to be a mixed use, although it's really two kinds of uses right now. Um, the first is 200 apartments. Um, and then um, there'll be a Wegmans, which would be about 100,000 square feet. Um, and there'll be 50,000 square feet of retail. Um, the, in the near term, what the overlay says is the developer can now present a plan to get approved. The developer already has drawings and initial drawings, but they still go through the standard uh, land use development process with the same reviews by the planning uh, commission and the board of supervisors at each step. So the detailed drawings uh, and plans for the Prickett Preserve complex will be coming soon. Um, and in fact, uh, we'll try and go on. Um, they're probably not yet on the LMT website, but one of the things that we have in the planning and zoning portion of our website is access to all um, the documents now, which is a big change from where things used to be. Um, and the nice thing about that is you should be able to see um, the actual plans um, where they're at in process. So you can see um, where things are. Um, and I think the next element is as we get the, the first uh, sort of draft of the, the, the documents, that's an excellent time to review um, in terms of uh, making sure that everything's accessible. And I think um, you know, that, that should be coming soon. Let's see if I've got, yeah. So right now, if you go to um, the LMT, right, there's not, the, the plans are not there yet available because they haven't been submitted yet. Um, the one element that was discussed, and I don't know if people were curious about, the, it would, the vote was, uh, was for one. One area that was of some discussion with the planning commission was um, size of parking spaces and making sure uh, that we have wide enough parking spaces uh, for, for many people, because in many cases, uh, uh, handicapped or accessible parking gets used up and yet near in parking needs to be wide enough to accommodate when possible. Uh, so that was talked about, and the, it will end up being a, a standard size parking uh, spot. Um, but there may be, there'll be larger ones closer uh, for folks. In John, terms of process, as soon as we get the, the drawings, I mean, we can, uh, that, that we can get a start on that. Yeah, I, we're really looking forward to that. John, last year, the, last year at the end of the year, the, uh, we as a group wrote a letter to the supervisors and uh, the, I don't know if you remember it, but basically the, 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 the takeaway or, or what we wanted the supervisors to take away is that we wanted to be, you know, we found that, that accessibility um, rules and, and standards are very hard to, to um, address once a building has been built. So we really want to focus our efforts on, um, first and foremost, on new construction. And we want to not just make sure that they meet law, but we want to see if we can encourage the developers in practical ways to make the properties more accessible or more disability friendly. And so I think that one of the things we want to do is we want to get those plans and we want to look at that and we want to look not just beyond just the basics. So for example, something that's important to us, there's not really a lot of uh, apartments in the township that really have accessible floor plans, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be nice if you're putting in 200 garden style apartments that maybe more than one of them or more than two of them right. are, have accessible floor plan. And usually the accessibility is, um, the biggest issues are in the bathroom area so um, you go to uh, an apartment complex such as the Edge, and I'm, I'm just picking on the Edge because I happened to, to rent there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. At the time, they only had one or two accessible units. And they have a lot of units. So, and, and that complex was, that's a post-ADA uh, 
complex. I believe that like late nineties or very early two thousands. So I think it's going to be important for us to make sure that that, there, that that more of the units are accessible to people with disabilities. Is there a particular standard for percent of uh, units within a multifamily dwelling that should be accessible? For apartments? Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, off the top of my head, I, I, I don't know if there's a percentage. Um, but that's something that we should definitely put on our list to look into. Because if we think that, um, and I also think too, it, it could be a point of differentiation if it's underserved that they could be able to capture the rents that they're looking for. Um, that if we think it should be five or 10% of the units, um, you know, would meet uh, market demand, that should be something we should think about. And I don't know if there was a standard that would certainly help us make the case on that. Yes, no, I, I agree. Now I have been in in some apartment buildings. I lived in an apartment building um, for a couple of years that was very new, and almost all of the units had had relatively accessible restrooms and stuff. But I think it was just a design feature mm -hmm. units. So it may be that it really we need to see the the floor plans, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think is for for basic accessibility, and then. And then you can ask questions. I mean, there's different levels of accessibility. I should caveat this. So I'm just talking about a minimal standard of, of a, a layout where a person with, with a, in a wheelchair can, can access all the rooms. I mean, that's, that's a relatively low bar, um, at least in my mind. You, you, can get, you can have higher bars in there. You know, are there any of the rooms going to have uh, a wheelchair accessible shower? As opposed to a tub, you know, you can ask those types of questions as well. And I think, I think we can look up standards. But I also think that, you know, if the standards are lacking, I think we should also be willing to speak to the developers. Not understanding that not necessarily we're going to get everything that we want, but to have that discussion up front um, to see what is possible. Another example would be the parking in front of, uh, excuse me, the curbs in front of Wegmans, you know, are they going to be, um, are there going to be curbs or is it going to be a, uh, an area where there's uh, basically a, a continuous kind of ramp um, and, and they have, um, you know, columns, uh, concrete columns to protect uh, from vehicles uh, you know, going through the, instead of hopping the curb, going through that area um, so that pedestrians are protected protected. And we actually have an example of this in the township, the, I believe the shop, right? Lisa, weren't you, uh, this group was a part of encouraging the shop, right? To, uh, adopt, uh, a more wheelchair friendly layout, um, at its entrances after it was renovated a few years ago. Or am I misremembering? Yes. Well, no, shop, right was, yeah, that's the awful parking lot by Coles and shop, right. But, Prior to their restriping and ShopRite coming in, uh, we worked with the engineer to make to even move curb cuts to where they would be better suited for people crossing. Um, the, the curb cuts were at the worst place, right where everybody was turning. So we kind of moved those. They added additional striping. So there's a lot of things you can do, and they didn't necessarily have to do, you know, all of that. They didn't have to move them, you know. Uh, they had the adequate number of curb cuts, but it, it was just even just from a common sense uh, standpoint. So we like to work up front with any builder, anyone uh, new construction to work with them prior to construction, just like the green building. Yeah, maybe you're thinking about the green building over behind Floral Vale. Uh, once we brought up, you know, the handicap parking, they said, why don't we just take the curbs out? and you know, make them all accessible. So that was an easy fix, they did it. And um, I think there's medical offices in there. So it made more sense to have uh, more than the required one to eight, uh, you know, one handicap parking spot for every eight, um, they actually, you know, put in additional. So, uh, you know, we'd like to get up front and work with uh, someone beforehand. And, and Dave will do that, Dave Rogers is the, um, He'll look at the plans. We usually get them from Jim and Juski. 
Uh, we look at them and then we will write up our comments. And I think at that point, that that's a, a, a place where we should put in as much as we think and more. Um, I did just look up it, uh, federal housing is 5%. So 5% of the apartments have to be uh, for that's federally, uh, federal buildings. Um, so, you know, that would be 10 apartments that would be required, but, you know, maybe talking with the builder, we can say yes, 10, you know, if, if it is 5%, 10 have to be handicap accessible. However, your design, if you just put in a walk-in shower, you know, on the first floor, you now can say that 20 or 30 are accessible. So there might be just an easy pre-construction fix that could accommodate, you know, a, a lot of various different abilities. Um, so yes, we would want to just get the plans, look at them up front, make our recommendations. Uh, and like you said, even with the bathrooms, uh, you know, if they have bathrooms, we're, we're going to say, well, we need more family restrooms where someone can go in, uh, you know, a husband and wife can go in together uh, or, or if you have a child. So I think we can have our voice hopefully heard when we receive the plans and write up our comments of what we would like to see. Yeah. No, Lisa, that's a great point. That was the property that I was thinking about, that office building. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the... So, you know, I think all of these examples are examples of uh, this group getting involved uh, at the early phases and working in partnership with the developers to go beyond the basic ADA standards in ways that are not, that are not expensive, but that make a big difference as far as accessibility. So we're looking forward to doing that. I think the issue, Lisa, with federal housing Standards. I don't. I don't think that these apartments would be considered federal housing. So no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't uh, meet that. Need to meet that standard. But I do like the five percent because it gives a a benchmark that we can talk to them about to say mm -hmm. that you know, even though you're not required to do this, this is when the federal government's building housing. This is what they're thinking about as far as the percentage of units that should be accessible. So we're not. My guess is that they're going to be garden style apartments. There's probably not going to be elevators. So probably want to do this on units that are on the first floor, um, you know, and, and have them make sure that they meet certain specifications. So the other thing I was thinking with the Pricket um, track is um, I do live within walking distance of it or bike riding distance of it. So I'm often on the bike paths and I know they want to make this a walkable, you know, I mean, the whole idea is you're within walking district distance of the historic, um, historic district. So a lot of the bike paths, I know we're looking at um, to fix them, but maybe as part of the Pricket tract, could we put some of the responsibility onto the builder to say within the mile, whatever the overlay is, that they need to create safe uh, bike paths, because right now, uh, the bike paths leading on Township Line Road, there are gaps that even my bike with thick tires, um, I have difficulty, you know, like I'm going to fall off my bike. So there's no way that a wheelchair could, could you know, so is that yeah, something we could add into their... That's all I think you're frozen, John. Oh. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so in the initial plans that they provided, they had bike paths. They also have um, access to Edgewood Village uh, over the bridge. So part of the deal was that they would restructure uh, the bridge section so someone could, in fact, uh, walk from the apartments over the, the bridge into Edgewood Village. And that was part of the, uh, the, the pitch. Um, and I'm talking more about even making them go further. So take it all the way down to Floral Vale. Uh, again, people from the apartments might be going to doctors or going to the Chinese restaurant or going to the banks there. Yeah. So I'm, I don't even want to just see it going over to Edgewood. I well, want to see it a mile around. Yeah, <laughs> but they, uh, <laughs> they don't own the, the property I, the Lower Mayfield Corporate Center, you know, that, that was, um, 
there are things that are being redeveloped in the Lower Mayfield Corporate Center to improve the frontage for walkability there too. Okay. Uh, but yes. Um, okay. Well, okay. So we we look forward to uh, seeing those plans and having those discussions in the days ahead. So the next thing that we'd like to turn to are the highlights from the site reviews. So uh, Dave is not here, so we won't talk about his sites. But uh, Trish or Lisa, would, would either of you like to go first and give a, an overview of your sites or would you like me to go first? Whatever you say, Dave. Okay, let me, let me I'll just go quickly first to, to give you, you know, the sense of how high at a high level, I'll keep it. So, so I had to look at the two tennis courts uh, in Yardley Hunt, one's on Review Road, one's at the end of Skylar. I also looked at Macclesfield Park. So the two tennis courts, one is in great shape because it was just redone. Probably that's the one on Revere Road. And the only thing I think it really needs is a uh, striping for a wheelchair except for a, an accessible parking space. The other spot, the other, Tennis court on Skylar needs a lot of work. There's no curb cut to cross the street from the bike track over to the parking lot. The slope uh, of the parking lot right off of the road is, which is the only way if someone in a wheelchair can get through is, is uh, too steep to be compliant. Uh, the parking lot's in a bad state of repair, including the, the small path from the parking lot to the tennis court. And then the tennis court itself has several several cracks. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make that accessible. I think that, I think accessibility is important full stop, but also there is a sport called wheelchair tennis where people mm -hmm. in wheelchairs play tennis on regulation tennis courts. And so it's, I think it's critically important that our tennis courts are accessible. And we have one that's that uh, more or less is, and the other one is not. So turning to Macclesfield Park real quick, um, there's a number of issues and um, the, the ones that I think are probably worth highlighting the most, uh, there are no accessible parking spots there that have any striping uh, for people with disabilities to get in and out of their vehicles, no spaces for wheelchair vans and that's a, that's a big issue. All the pavilions, which they sometimes have events at, there are no, ex, there are no paved paths to those pavilions. Uh, a few other things that, there are a number of issues with the, I don't know what to call it, the field house or the main building, basically where the bathrooms are and uh, the concession stand. A lot of accessibility issues there. They have a number of uh, portable restrooms scattered throughout the site. I don't think any of those would be considered wheelchair accessible. So there's a number of issues. Um, and we'll, we'll give the, we're recording all of these things, writing them down, giving them parks and recs. So they have a list of things they need to follow up on. But I, there are a number of issues at Macclesfield Park. I think that a lot of them can be resolved. Um, relatively low cost manner, but there's a lot of work there. So Lisa or Trish, would you like to go next? I'll go ahead. Um, I had two areas to look at. Uh, one is uh, Five Mile Wood and the other was the dog park. So um, Five Mile Wood, uh, I would say it's not accessible in any way from the parking lot to the trails to the, I don't know what they call it, maybe the visitor center. Um, the parking lot is kind of a gravel. There's no handicapped parking areas. It uh, transitions to a concrete pathway where there's a, you know, a substantial lip to get onto the concrete. But if you're in a chair, once you get on that concrete, there virtually is no place for you to go. The trails are not accessible. Um, they're overgrown with tree, roots and narrow and the visitor center. I couldn't get in, it's closed, but it looks to be about 20 feet wide, but it's very crowded inside. 
there is a bathroom inside. There's a bathroom outside. Both uh, areas were locked. Uh, didn't, didn't Just from looking at the outside without being able to go in, it didn't look like anything would have been accessible in there. Not the bathrooms, not even the room itself. So um, I, I, don't, I don't know what, it, it would take a lot to, to try and make that accessible. I don't think it's possible, frankly. So uh, the other area that I looked at was the dog park. That's um, also uh, kind of a gravel parking area, but then there are two uh, paved, asphalt paved areas for handicap parking. One is a van accessible spot and the spot next to it, if you uh, backed into it would also, you could, sh you would share the aisle, the access aisle. Both are compliant, they're wide enough, they're long enough. <clears throat> the gates to get in the park are also very nice. They're four feet wide. Uh, the first gate you enter has a, sort of, I don't know what you call it. It's like a pump on it. So it closes automatically. It, it's very nice. And every uh, inside the gates and inside the second set of gates, there is a concrete area um, with plenty of room to turn around if you're in a chair. I'm not too, sh I, I don't think it's, you would want to go on to the, grassy area there's some hills and bumps and so forth but otherwise it's a very it's a very nice and i would say uh, very nice accessible area that's it okay thank you you know it's it, it strikes me that the dog park is a recent addition to park and rec right so yeah accessible uh five mile woods has been around for a long time and yeah. And is not accessible. I think, I mean, I think there, there are challenges at Five Mile Woods, and I think that the people who oversee it like the natural state of Five Mile Woods, but it is a shame that people with disabilities can't really enjoy it no. at all. Um, it's, it's, I'd always wanted to go to Five Mile Woods growing up, uh, and I was injured. I lived in the township the vast majority of my life, and, um, was injured at the age of 15 and I guess guess I missed my window to go to, to Five Mile Woods because I can't really get to it now. Yeah. Um, and that's that's kind of sad. That's sad to me that I can't enjoy Five Mile Woods. So I think, uh, well, we're gonna bring these things to, to, to Park and Rec, but hopefully they'd be able to talk a little bit more about, see if something can be done to make it at least a little bit more accessible on a very limited basis, but I, just, I agree with you, Trish. It sounds like it's going to take a lot of work. I, I doesn't honestly, as I was walking through there, it didn't seem that it was feasible to fix it. There is it once you get onto one of the trails and go a fair distance, there is a, you, I guess you could call it a boardwalk. It's a very short boardwalk, about 20 yards maybe, but it, just even getting there would be very challenging because there are it's not just a plain trail, it kind of slopes down. And what they did is put railroad ties across the trail. So now it becomes a step. So there's several of those steps to overcome for. It's just, it just didn't seem feasible to me to fix it. Yeah, it sounds like it would be a lot of work. Yeah. So. Okay. Lisa, would you like to share the sites that you looked at? Sure, I guess um, first I disagree that it, it can be made accessible. Oh. So at, this is why we're doing what we're doing, okay? So I have high hopes that we have two years, we, let's think of it this way, we have two years to submit our plans, basically the Parks and Rec Department. And we're gonna submit a detailed, what we, what we would like to see done, okay? then they have many, many years to implement it. You know, we're, they're gonna put a cost to it and this is something we want to achieve. You know, it might not be done overnight, but this is, we wanna say, this is what we would, this is what it needs to be. And we can list everything out and then at some future time it will be done. So I'm, I'm optimistic. That's, that's a good point. So we don't wanna close the door to Exactly. I, yeah. And, and we can be come up with a lot of creative ways. 
So I, I took, um, and I did send um, Trish something yesterday. Uh, it's to trail in Tennessee. And I, I'm looking at beautiful pictures of a park that kind of looks like Five Mile Woods. And they've done, you know, maybe the whole thing isn't accessible, but it's, um, it's a Greenways and Trails Program ADA Accessibility Guidelines. So I did send that to Trish, so I can um, go ahead and you know forward that to you too, Dave. Yeah, these are so, one, sorry, sorry to interrupt. One thing I wanted to mention is, uh, in the past few weeks, I actually went to Hawk Mountain recently. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it was a place that I actually went to when I was growing up, and um, I wanted my son to see it, so we went up in August, and it's all outdoors, so you can socially distance. But what they did is, they if you've ever been to Hawk Mountain. There's a lot of trails and a lot of them are very inaccessible. But what they did is they made one trail that is very accessible to an outlook that is very accessible. So, and I, I thought it was great, right? Because I think I, you're I, frozen, Dave. Sorry, sorry can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what I was saying is that they didn't make a lot of it accessible as far as percentage wise but they made enough of it accessible that it really made a big difference and I could enjoy the, the, uh, the preserves. So there are paths to make even very inaccessible places accessible to a certain extent that, that um, it, can, it can be um, very helpful and beneficial. Right. So I, I took a little different approach um, with with looking at, I had Memorial Park and I wanted to look at very specific things, not just, you know, improve this, improve that, but um, even as going far as trash receptacles, you know, they should be put within 24 inches of an accessible path. So the placement of where you put trash cans, uh, the number of fixed benches that they have there, um, it looks like maybe 20% need to be off of an accessible path with the ability to have a wheelchair uh, next to it. So maybe a, a hard surface so a wheelchair can sit next to a companion you know, on a bench. Um, the number of picnic tables. So I did look at the picnic tables and they are accessible there, but you have to make sure because the ends of the picnic tables, you can kind of slide under with a wheelchair. So, they are accessible, but we'd like to see 50% of the picnic tables. So I'm putting a specific number. We want to see 50% of the picnic tables should be accessible. Uh, water fountains, you know, to make sure they have multi-level. Uh, so the one that we currently have in the pavilion is fine, but when they build something new over in the north end, you know, we want to just keep that into consideration. I did look at the playground. That is going to be needing some repair. Uh, so uh, they're going to be replacing a lot of the surface because there are holes and, and gaps in there. There isn't shade, you know, even you know, people with disabilities and children with disabilities, we should be providing some sort of shade. And that is not, um, we thought we might have a volunteer group to do that, but um, they won't be doing that this year. Uh, pathways to any sort of uh, recreational court. So we have the basketball court and the volleyball courts currently at Memorial Park. We need to provide some sort of pathway down to those areas. Um, now it could be right off of the bike path. I mean, the 1K path that's there. Um, so it would be a shorter distance, but they should provide. So that's something just accessible walkways. Um, the red tipple that's there is going to be replaced. I mean, it already has been replaced around the Arboretum, around the 9-11 Memorial. And I did go up there today because when I went up there last week, it hadn't been poured because of humidity. So I went up there today and it looks beautiful. Um, we did look, it's, it's four feet wide. And if you have paths that are four feet, less than five feet, you have to provide a place where people can kind of go around each other every 100 feet or 200 feet. So it looks like 
we kind of had that at Memorial Park because there's little benches, little cutouts. So it does get five feet wide in several of the areas. So that might be, um, might be okay. But again, something to keep in mind when they're redoing, uh, I think they're gonna redo all the red tipple, uh, even going off to the north end of the uh, Memorial Park. Parking, I did take a look at the parking in the new area on the north end. They haven't striped yet, so they're going to have to add two parking spaces. So they're going to make those, uh, have to stripe those and make them van accessible. There's a small parking lot outside of the 9-11 Memorial where the path begins. So I just so happened to be there when Monica Tierney was there and we su suggested that we put it right where the path begins, where the striping can go and put one van accessible parking spot there. Um, again, looking at all the bike paths coming from Woodside, making sure there's not no more than a half inch gap in any of those walkways. And I think as a township, we are doing that on all the bike paths. So I kind of, that's all I saw for now, but I really laid it out where, um, you know, bathrooms that are there, they were locked, so I couldn't, you know, go into them, but the porta potties should be wheelchair accessible. So the one that's out by the uh, playground right now is wheelchair accessible. But for, again, for the north end, they have to keep that in mind if they do put a porta potty to put a wheelchair accessible porta potty. Um, but I wanted to take every one, we need to look at every park and maybe put what I'm seeing here at Memorial Park into place down to the trash cans. And what we want to do is put in a plan. So the parks and rec department for any future parks or enhancements would take these guidelines and apply them to, to anywhere, whether it's Five Mile Woods, whether it's the dog park, you know, if you have a trash receptacle, where does it go? If you have a walkway, what, what does it have to be made of the material? How wide does it have to be? So I think we're gonna to start to see some redundancies. Um, so I didn't look at any other, anything else until we decided maybe which direction, you know. I think what we should do, Lisa, is we should write down, you know, those kind of common design stand, standards that we're looking yeah. at. And then, and just say, this is the benchmark going forward. And we could then compare each of the sites to the benchmarks. Um, I mean, you, we can do that. We probably should do that, but we should also realize that once we give them the ben benchmarks at the park and racks, whenever they're updating something, they should be using the benchmarks. So if they're going to Macclesfield Park and they're moving trash cans, they need to move them according to the bench, the, the, the accessibility benchmarks that we've given them, right? The 24 inches off an accessible path, right? So I think by, by doing it that way, um, it's kind of a more comprehensive approach instead of site by site. So we don't have to police where they're putting trash cans as much as tell them when you put a trash can somewhere, use these standards. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, so on the spreadsheet that you, you know, provided for us to complete, you can maybe take a look at what I've done and maybe we can use this for each site. We can kind of condense this to the benchmarks and then have everyone use those when we do go out to the sites, I guess. We could just put the benchmarks on like a Word doc. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of as a standalone, you know, these are the, and, not, and write them in a way that's not even tied to the sites and just say, you know, these are the standards that parking recs should be using. Trash cans, you know, these are the, the dimensions, this is the distance. And picnic tables, picnic you know, table. right. Yeah, so on and so forth. And, and, then, and then our future reviews can incorporate it. But again, I think even more importantly, just the, having parking recs review that list and agree to essentially adopt it, right? And, and, and um, you know, change things according to those standards, I think will be great progress. But that's very helpful, Lisa. Thank you for the thorough review. Mm -hmm.
was you you only had Memorial Park, not only that's a big site, but <laughs> um, no, I was supposed to look at Veterans Park, but I mean it's going to be the similar. It's going to be similar. I just didn't write it up yet, but yeah. Okay, not a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so John, do you have any comments on anything that we just shared? No, I, I certainly welcome the checklist of things to look for because it's one of those things that uh, I don't always see it. Um, so I'd appreciate that when I'm looking around and, and stuff. And I also, um, I will have an email out to Jim on Cricket Preserve as soon as we're done the meeting. Okay, great. So, so we're at, we're at 8.22 and so a few more things. I think we want to um, maybe give a few more assignments we can, we can do that offline, uh, just distribute a few more sites and then we can talk about them at the next meeting. Excuse me, as far as the next meeting, uh, I was thinking that we could probably do one, our next meeting in November and I wanted to see if the members wanted to do, do November or do you, would you like to meet um, in October as, as well? I'm good with, good with November. Okay. Yeah, they're just be given that we didn't have the the roll and stroll this year, community day, community day, and a lot of things. We just we haven't been as active this year as we have in previous years, just because of the pandemic. Is that okay with you, Lisa and John? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. That's One fine. other thing that that Lisa mentioned, and this is the last thing before we adjourn. There is a site under development, I believe you said, near. Big Oak and Oxford Valley. Oh uh, yeah, we just, I mean, Dave Rogers should be receiving plans from Jim before anything is built, but it's right next to the Capitol Health, um, right across from CVS. If, if There's a new building going in. Is that the Dunkin' Donuts? I think we have seen plans for one. Oh yeah, if you're thinking about that, that was a while ago. That's been, yeah. that was a couple of years ago. Yeah, but I don't think this is a Dunkin' Donuts. I think, are they building just another, Capital Health is building another building next to the no, existing the, one? Uh, this is across from the CVS yeah. on Big Oak, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that is, it's, it was going to be a daycare and doctor's office. The okay. Dunkin' Donuts is, would be on the corner, but we I don't think that's operative now. Yeah, we've never seen those plans for the that I know. site. The doctor's office and the daycare. Okay. okay, so um, uh, we'll just send an email to Dave and ask him to touch base with Jim about uh, plans for that. And then the, the only other plans that I, John, maybe you know, up here on Township Line, remember they were doing a bunch of construction and we talked about this last month, but it looks like they're doing, a, it looks like an amphitheater. It looks like a stage. Are you talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? Across from 777. So it's, it's. I don't know if you consider that the South Campus or North ca South Campus. Right, it's Lower Mayfield Corporate Center that they're reading. Yeah. Okay, yes. What are they building there? Uh, let's see. It literally looks like a stage, like a performing stage. Um, I have to pull it because I saw that when I was on the planning commission last year. And um, I know we didn't look at anything. I, I know because we brought this up saying it just looked like they were doing something to the parking lot. They were doing but stuff in the parking lot in the back where they were uh, making. No, this is this is on the pond. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to look that one up. Okay, so I we need Dave Rogers to look at that because if they are using it for any type of gathering. I mean, it literally looks like a beautiful wood wood stage with speakers. And I didn't really get close. I'm only looking at it from the road. Yeah. And I'm gonna assume that it's all accessible, but it, it looks like a major project. I mean, they've been working on it for five, six months. Yeah, let's not assume, assume it's accessible. <laughs> yeah, let's not. We okay. Look, we need to look at it. So yeah, yeah and I, I think that this is you know I, I'm becoming a little bit frustrated because it seems to be a pattern like there was work done in Veterans Park and now it seems that there are other properties or other construction things that we're just not getting. I, you know I I don't know 
why. Um, and if you recall, I did send a letter to township manager and to LMT concerning this, expressing our concern that we were not being alerted, yeah. and, you know, prior to yeah. new new things being developed. So, and, yeah, maybe. No, that daycare was a while ago, though. The approval on that was a long time ago. I'm trying to think because there's a sub development and land development subdivision and land development status sheet, and that has all the open projects. Um, in there, and it tells you where um, the SAS, uh, like for example, the, the daycare center that you were talking about, which was across from um, um, you know, across from the CVS on Big Oak Road, which I didn't notice. Yeah, so that was let's see. Um, this is the Octagon Center, so it's forty five hundred square foot office building. The final amended plan was approved in February of 2019. Um, so that's why it, that, that was a long time ago. Yeah, but all of us have been on the board long enough. That, yep. Yeah. That we would have that we would have remembered it. So yeah, if we had seen it. So I think you know I understand maybe the the theater or audit. Yeah. Maybe that could have gotten under the radar. Maybe that didn't have to be to go through normal channels, but that property on that corner, we should have yeah, we should have seen that. Unless Dave looked at it and it was fine. I, I don't know, maybe he- It's possible he did. The, yeah. the Lower Mayfield Corporate Center South Campus is a reconfiguration of the front parking lot to create the courtyard near the pond. So, uh, and then some outdoor gathering spaces. There's a yeah. sum reduction yeah. in parking, some traffic calming elements and improved pedestrian circulation. Um, you've got the same issue that the corporate, the North campus, they were doing a lot there as well. I don't know if they've started that um, construction. Oh, there has been a lot of construction on the North one too, so. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe if the, if the South is done, but the North isn't, maybe we should take a look at it. If, if, the, if there are plans for the North, we should, sounds like the South may be done, but we might. Let me see if I can find, um, 16, 19, uh, let's see. I might be able to find the plans just to kind of give you an idea what's in there. Uh, well, I think what's important, John, is maybe, you know, even though it's just, we're thinking they're minor cosmetic things to parking lots and outdoor gatherings, if there's any kind of construction, even if it's restriping, I mean, it would be nice if we could take a look at it. I'm, I, I don't know, this, it doesn't seem like it should just go through without the normal process of letting the township committees review things. I mean, these are fairly large projects if they're going on for six months. And even the North Campus one, they've been working on, on I don't know, parking or whatever for, for months and months now. Uh, they're pulling up vegetation, so it has the EAC looked at those plans. You know, they, I, yeah. I'm just surprised that we're not we're not being alerted to these. I'm going to get you the plans for uh, Lower Mayfield Corporate Center North and South. I'm downloading them now as we speak. Uh, what's the other one you're looking for? Um, I guess that that daycare and um, yeah. The, year, the octagon that was February 6, 2019. Let's see if I can get that too. Okay. Okay. So I mean we can we can get these, but just I guess take note that we're concerned that there's construction projects going on that township committees are not having any type of input prior to the you know prior to the start of them. Nope. And, and, and all the more reason that we that we want to make sure that the moment that the the brick attract plans <laughs> become available, we want to be able to start looking at them. And I have the email drafted already uh, for Mr. Majewski, and I have a task list for myself to follow up with him on it. I I appreciate that. Yep. Uh, um, I really appreciate your follow through on uh, on these issues. 
So, okay, is there um, anything else? Go ahead. The, the one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, everyone out there in the public that's watching the meeting, we are we do have a position open at two positions, a regular member and an alternate member. So if you would like to um, apply for a position on the Disability Advisory Board, you can send a resume to uh, Kurt uh, Ferguson at lmt.org. Um, I can't remember his, is it? Kurt F at lmt.org. Kurt, Kurt, Kurt F at lmt. K-U-R-T F at lmt. Mm -hmm. And we would really appreciate, you know, anyone um, that would like to apply um, and help us out. I would say one of the, the perks is you get to see all those building plans early, but <laughs> we're not seeing it. Hopefully it all changed, yes. <laughs> no, we, you know, the, the it's, um, I, I think Trish and, and Lisa have been on the board a little bit longer than actually Lisa has been on a lot longer. She was one of the founding members, but um, you know, I think that it's been a rewarding experience. And I think that you, you do look at more than just building plans and sites, but you're, you're making contributions that I think maybe some people may not see in their every day as they go along the township. But um, when people are able to get in and out of buildings easier, um, when they're able to contact or have first responders know um, about their medical needs uh, when they're in distress, those, those types of things um, can make a difference in people's lives. So um, please, if you're interested, uh, apply. So, okay. So uh, we, I will reach out to you guys offline about mm -hmm. scheduling our next meeting. But in the meantime, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, I think the ayes have it. Well, thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.